You may be seated. We were out of town last week, but before we left, I wanted to make sure to go stop and see some folks, and so I uh, took a day and I drove over to Trenton. I saw Bill Bingham, a guy from uh, Green City Church. Had a great lunch at Wild Onions, this great uh, lunch place over there. Highly commend it to you. Went down to Chilla Coffee. I uh, had coffee at the Boji Stone, very tasty. Went over to uh, uh, Brookfield. Uh, to go see Keith Reinhardt on the way, stopped at that Amish store and got some snacks. It was a very tasty day. Uh, and saw Keith, and that was admittedly hard. Um, and then drove home, and, and I pulled up into uh, the driveway and um, ready to, good day, seeing people. Opened my door to get out of the car. The Honda, that green box, it drives well, grid mileage, very practical. Seats, oh my God, <laughs> those seats did me in. My back, I don't know why it was that time, I tried to get out and I could barely move. My back had uh, just, it was in bad, bad shape. And for, so for a day I tried to tough it. You know how when your back hurts you sit very straight? And then your kid runs up to you and you bend at the knees to pick up your, your kid, but not at the, <laughs> I tried it for a day, but it, it just kept on getting worse. What happens is when one muscle seizes up, the muscles around it try to tighten to make sure that one center one doesn't uh, get me further messed up, and then those are overstressed, so you just have this radiating worse, worse, worse thing. And so I gave in, finally gave in, male pride, and I called uh, Sharon Wheeler, that blessed saint of Milan. She, isn't she great? You, you know where this is going. I will go out to Sharon Wheeler's. We live southeast of Milan here, and I went for a deep tissue massage. And, and I lay down on her table, and, and, uh, and I and get lay down. She's going to start working, and uh, lay down, and she starts doing this. And, and she would like find a muscle, and she'd kind of touch it. And then she'd move on to the next one. And I'm thinking that she's getting warmed up. She's going to start pushing at some point, right? This is deep tissue massage, and I'm expecting her to kind of give a good shove at some point, because I'm hurting. I need help. And uh, she never actually pushes. She would uh, find a, a muscle, she'd touch it, hold that touch consistently, and, and then she would move on. And uh, I didn't understand what was happening. And usually when I don't understand, I ask a question or two. I want to find out what's happening. It's kind of hard to ask a question. Your face is in that, uh, that circular thing, and, and uh, it comes out kind of, you sound, sound like the teacher in Charlie Brown. It just doesn't work. So, uh, so I had, and I was there, I was really messed up. I was there for an hour and 15 minutes getting, getting taken care of. And so I had plenty of time to uh, think about what was happening. The way that touch uh, and the areas of, of my back that I had managed not to mess up was good. Felt good, right? Pleasurable. And the touch and the places where I had messed up my back, she would touch it and I'd flinch. You know that flinch when someone touches a, a rough thing? And uh, it, every place she would touch that was messed up, I would flinch involuntarily. And uh, when she touched what f was doing doing well, that felt good. And whenever she touched what was messed up, if she if she pushed any harder, I would have just kept on flinching, right? It, but the consistent touch would actually help the muscle to relax, and then she could move on. The touch where it was healthy was pleasant. The touch where it was messed up was about all that I could take. That constant touch uh, was what it took to get my back back in order. I had assumed that deep tissue massage meant that uh, she would find the places that were hurt and then push harder. And I was wrong. What deep tissue massage means is that she would use the same amount of pressure, just a, that consistent touch, but she would pay attention where that touch stirred something deep, something messed up. And, and then she, there were some places that were messed up. It does work really well. Oh man, it's amazing. Four years ago I was sitting in a circle with um, a bunch of teens at the church camp that I've helped with, a counselor, 12 of us, and we were sweating because that's what you do at late July at church camp. And uh, it was the second day and um, two full days and had plenty of time, e eaten multiple meals together at this point, had played big group games, been to worship a few times, and uh, so pretty much knew each other, but there was one more icebreaker game we were going to play. 
Uh, and two truths and a lie. Um, you may have played this game before, two truths and a lie. You come up with the two most random truths and the most believable lie you can tell about yourself and see if the rest of them can, get, can guess. So I do things like I'm an Eagle Scout, I love to sail, and I want to have six kids. And uh, you all know which one is a lie there because we are surgically certain that two is it. Uh, <laughs> so we, we, every, I start that out. And we're going around the circle and having fun. And we got to right there, three quarters of the way around the circle. And a person I spoke, and this person had been highly involved in all the games and worship, really obviously wanted to be there, but hadn't said anything really. And so this person shared their uh, two truths and a lie. And I honestly do not remember the, the, the first two things that were said because it was the third thing the person said. I would give anything to see my grandma again. Right? And, and, and then the people guessed which one was a lie, but didn't really catch, pick up on that. And, and, I, and I was just dumbstruck. I didn't know what to say. Thankfully, there were two more people and another counselor. And uh, they got done. Everyone looks at me. What are we going to do next, Andy? So I look at that person and I say, tell, tell me about your grandma. And we heard about this saint of, a church, of, of the church, this saint who had, I mean, just an amazing person who had touched people's lives. And, and, and it was just amazing to hear about this person and how much this person was missed and how much it had mattered to this person. And, uh, and other people could then talk about the people they missed. And uh, I, I did not sit down with that group and say, okay. We are now going to have a deep and interesting discussion about grief, loss, and hope in your lives. Who would like to go first? No. We played a game, two truths and a lie, and then when something came up, we noticed, right? It's not that I was trying to get deep and, and, and really, and, and we've been playing together for two days, but, but then something deep stirred, and we paid attention to it. Our lives had been touching for, consistently for a while, and then... We, we, pay, we paid attention when something, something mattered. Right? Just like with this deep tissue massage, I, I thought, thought of That's why I started thinking of hour and 15 minutes on the table. Did I mention that? Uh, I had lots of time to think. I, I, that came to mind and thought, you know, that I was not pushing, I was not shoving. We were just there touch, having our lives touch each other. And then something deep stirred, and thankfully we paid attention. This, my friends, is what I think of when I think of evangelism, which is the, the, the naughty word that we're scared of saying. They can track, if you put the word evangelism on the front cover of a book and you try to sell it, they can track how much lower your sales will be because you said evangelism and everyone's scared of it. It's, it's the E word. We don't talk about that in church. Uh, evangel, evangel means good news. That's all it means. Be, uh, good news. And I, I wish we, we could just say good news. Good newsism doesn't roll off the tongue very well though. But evangelism is about creating and maintaining these relationships and friendships and like a great massage where the contact, the touch between the lives uh, is, is healthy, it's enjoyable, and then every once in a while something deep is stirred. And then that's the moment, and it might take a while, that's the moment that you can say something, right? You spend, lot, you, you spend time with people that you care about, your friends, your family, and then when something deep stirs, something comes up, you can say... You know, can I get a couple people from the church and drop off some casseroles and lasagnas? Because you're having a rough go and you need to spend some time with the family, not worry about cooking. Right? Or, or you can say something like, you know, I hit that moment in my life and I just had to read the Gospel of Matthew again and again and again because I needed to hear good news. You know, talk about missing people. Uh, when you, the best I can say when someone talks about how much, how much they miss a loved one is say, you know, I come to communion and this is where I come when I'm missing my Aunt Dorothy, because this is the foretaste of the time I will eat with her again. Right? That, that, that's not trying to... We're now going to have an intense discussion about grief. It's just living with people, and when something stirs, paying attention. Right? Paying attention. That is, is evangelism, right? I, I started writing about this after I got home after that massage and uh, I got out my pen and I started writing. I figured I'd write up something and maybe email it out, uh, maybe a page or two. And 12 pages later, I had this sermon. And, and I realized that I needed to talk about this. It had been put upon me to talk about this because I, we've talked about reaching new people. We had that day talking about it a few weeks ago. 
And, and talking about reaching new people, it's something, it's a new thing. We haven't done it for a couple generations because the church, for the last hundred years, the way churches grow is people have kids. Yeah, right. You have kids, and then the kids stay here, and then they have kids, and their kids stay here. Well, kids started moving about 30 years ago, and we still haven't figured out how to respond yet. And this is how we respond. We reach new people, and that's a new thing. And you know what people think of when you say new? They think hard. Right? If you're going to do something new, how often do you assume that if it's going to be a new thing, it's going to be a hard thing? You're going to have to try, and you're going to have to push, and it's going to be challenging, right? New things mean hard things. And uh, talking about reaching new people, we assume it's going to be hard, and we assume it's going to put us in very awkward spots. I had no intention of bringing this up. Um, I, I had my parents this last week, and I didn't open a computer more than once, and it was beautiful. But uh, on vacation, I was with my parents, and they, we, they sat down to drink a bottle of wine with their neighbors. And on the second bottle of wine, uh, they started telling stories about kids. The neighbors have uh, some kids about the same age as mine, and they were running and playing and yelling. And I heard a story... I've never heard these stories before. I have kids and also my, I hear stories about when I was their age. And um, I heard a story about my, my mom saying uh, she got out of the shower and came downstairs and my dad was out at sea at that point and, um, and there was a nun in the living room. A nun had knocked on the door and my two-year-old brother had answered the door and invited her in. <laughs> And there was a nun, and my two, and Jake, and, and my, my mom, I don't know if I'm there or not, but my mom uh, asks the nun, huh? Or words to that effect. And the nun starts explaining that she'd been invited in. And what person takes the invitation of a two-year-old seriously? I mean, this is kind of scary. And, and the nun starts explaining that it, there, there's only one church, one true church, the Catholic church. And if you're not part of that church, your salvation, you're... You, uh, and this is like an evangelical Bible-thumping nun, which is just kind of weird to think about. And so then uh, the, another story comes up. We, they move to the next house, uh, and I hadn't heard this story either. The neighbors invited uh, me, my brother, and my mom over to a Tupperware party so that they knew my dad would be alone so that the Baptist pastor could come and knock on the door, get invited in, and start, there's only one true church. You hear the theme there? And if you're not part of this church... And so my dad offered him a beer, and uh, <laughs> the pastor said, we don't drink beer at my church, and the one true church. My dad said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> That, uh, and that was, I mean, you talk about doing this new thing, reaching new people, and we assume it's going to be hard, and then you start hearing stories like that. Because everyone has a story about some nun in your living room, or whatever it is. Uh, and we think that reaching new people is scary, and intimidating, and intense, and uh, no. No, 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 no. I, I, I reject all of that. I, I never want any of us to knock on a door. And if you ever find yourself uttering the words, are you sure you're, you know where you're going to go after you die? You're doing it wrong. Right? You're just doing it wrong. This is not hard. This is not about pushing. This is about touching people's lives in intentional and consistent ways. And then paying attention to people intentionally being connected to other people's lives, consistently doing so, and then paying attention. It's just like deep tissue massage, right? You could push hard, but you're either going to damage the relationships that are already there, because you're, then you're going to turn into that guy who's always trying to push people to church, or you're going to, if there is genuine pain, you're just going to scare people, right? It, pushing doesn't work. What does work is touching people's lives consistently. Lovingly, caringly, spending time together, and then when something deep stirs, because it will, being able to say a little bit of good news. All right. I want you to take a minute to think about how Jesus did this. Right? When Jesus shows up to the, those two brothers we read about and invites them, he does not look at them and say, Boys, I'm the Messiah, follow me or you're burning in hell. Right? That, that's not what he says. He says, follow me and I'll make you fisher of men. Follow me, right? Follow me and I'll make you fishers. Now, let's think a bit about fishing. Who here fishes? Right? Okay, when's the last time you went fishing and you came back having spent hours just... Right? How often do you break a sweat fishing because you're wrangling that... How, what do you do most of the time when you're fishing? You sit. 
usually with someone, and what are you doing? You're paying attention to what's happening that you can't see. Right? Fishing for men is like fishing for fish. You spend time with people and you pay attention to them because there's something moving under the waters. You just got to notice. Same thing with Paul. When Paul goes to a new city, we, we have these letters from Paul about the church. He's written to the churches he start, but it's not like he shows up in a new town and says, my name's Paul. Church. Right? That's not how it happened. He gets to a new town and he goes and he hooks up with the fellow Jews he knows at the synagogue. And then what does he do? Who here remembers what Paul's trade is? What does Paul do for a living? He's a tent maker, right? We don't really think about that much. Paul's gig is he'd show up, talk to Jews, get to know them, and he'd make tents. How long does it take to make a tent? Tents are big, right? You make a tent, it's not like make me a shish kebab or something quick. You make a tent, you're going to be there a while. These are long-term business relationships. You've got to find a cloth dealer to be able to get the cloth to make the tent. And so Paul was there for a while, touching people, being with people, gathering people, and then when something happened, he could say, let me tell you, you got some good news. There's this dude named Jesus. All right? To live together and to pay attention is evangelism. And, you know, they, they say never be the hero of your own sermon, and, and maybe I sound like one telling that story about two truths and the lie, and how, you know, it wasn't an amazing Andy picked that up. I'll tell you the scariest thing about telling that story is I wonder how many more such moments have, could there have been if over the years I, I could have been more intentional about spending time with the same people again and again. I have this impression I need to get out there and meet as many people as I can, and to a degree I do, but uh, maybe I just need to eat more, more meals with the same people again and again and get to know them. Maybe that's what we need to do as well. And so that's what I want to ask you to consider doing today. I want you to go out and do something fun. I know. I'm <laughs> Hard sell, right? Go figure out what you're going to do fun with someone else here at this church. Get two to three people together. You want to go do something fun? Go do something. And then invite someone that you know. I'm getting together with some people from the church. Will you come do something fun with us? Hard sell. We're going up to the movies. They're showing movies. I'm going to go up. Do you want to? Some people from the church are going to go up to see. You want to come join me? Or we're going to go. Uh, I'm going to cook a meal. Hey, Doug, you want to cook something tasty? You and I can cook something tasty and invite some people. We can do that. Or Carl, you got plenty. You got big, you're fishing. Can you invite some people to go fishing? And my life, wife likes to fish, and I'm sure my daughter will try to hook me. Last time I went fishing, my brother caught me. And uh, whew, don't invite me. I'm not. But I mean, these are the type of things. I know the ladies invite people to go quilting. Uh, just what can we do that are, is fun? And then invite someone, and then do it again. Right? This is not rocket science. This is not hard. This is just touching people's lives consistently. Right? The hardest part about this is doing it. Right? How often do you say, I should do that, and then you intend to do it, and you don't do it because you don't plan to do it, and then it just, just slips away? I want to ask you to, to think about that, and before the end of the day, heck, before you leave service, chat with someone about what can you do that would be fun, and maybe invite a person or two. And do it because that's how we love our neighbor, and that's how we pay attention to him. Amen.